This podcast is brought to you by Cash App. When personal finance connects you to both your funds and the stuff that matters, that's money and that's Cash App. You know what else is money? Choosing your own cash tag. That's money. Picking the cash tag, world's youngest baby. Using it to request the $50 your squirrely cousin owes you. Actually finally getting that $50. That's money. Your table at brunch, agreeing French toast is for sharing. Splitting the karaoke bill while still holding the high note. That's money. Digging a hole with friends. Digging out of that hole with friends. That's money. Hearing a wildly good musician on the train home and tipping their cash tag. That's money. Watching a fine pastry float down a river. That's money. Getting a slice of pepperoni pizza from Feeny Pizza. That's money. Getting paid to read a wonderful ad script for my good friends at Cash App. That's money. Sending everyone in the group chat a good night dollar. That's money. Waking up to all those good morning dollars. That's definitely money. Winning a very large bure pot. That's money. That is certainly money. Sending, spending, saving, investing, splitting, tipping, donating, gifting, or just typing numbers all with the number one finance app in the App Store. That's money. That's money. That's Cash App. Download Cash App from the App Store or Google Play Store today to add your cash tag to the community of millions and counting. Welcome to the Old Man of the Three with JJ Reddick and Tommy Alter, presented by Cash App and brought to you by 342 Productions. This is episode 128, Bradley Beal and Hassan Minhaj. Tommy, we have an excellent episode for our listeners and viewers today. Uh, we spoke with Brad in late August on a trip to LA. He was kind enough to uh, give us the time to chat. And look, one of the things that we had to talk about and, and certainly was going to come up was his contract. Brad signed the second largest contract in NBA history in terms of total dollars. Nikola Jokic, of course, signed the largest contract. Uh, he beat Brad out by several million, but still, a bag is a bag, Tommy. And we're, we're certainly happy for Brad. And we we talked to him about everything that went into this. You know, he spent his whole career in Washington, and you certainly wouldn't fault a guy if he wanted a change of pace or change of scenery. No, we get into this with him, but it's hard to fault uh, somebody taking care of their family, which is what he did with this deal. And I think we get into a lot of the stuff with the Wizards. You know, there's not a lot of talk about them right now, but they have a lot of interesting pieces. Uh, and he's really excited about it. He's really bullish about it. They're in uh, Japan right now uh, with the Warriors. And it's going to be fun to see. Uh, it's a brand new team. So it's going to be fun to see them sort of put this together, uh, built around him. He's He's fully healthy. Yeah, th there's definitely some pieces, and he seems very excited about what they're building. And he also recognizes and is open and truthful and honest about this that it's going to take some time to get back to the point where the war where the Wizards were, uh, you know, five years ago, where they were a game away from the conference finals. They lost Game Seven. I guess it was six years ago now, but they lost Game Seven and sixteen to the Boston Celtics, uh, and then after Brad, we have a phenomenal conversation with our buddy. Hassan Minhaj. Hassan has a Netflix special out this week. The King's Jester, I think you and I both can agree. This is one of the best stand-up specials we have ever seen. Uh, phenom phenomenally written, phenomenally produced and directed. Uh, Hassan has his fingerprints all over this special, and it's it's really an awesome view viewing experience. Yeah, he, it's it's a you know half comedy special, half one-man show. Um and you know we've known him for a long time, been sort of lucky to know him for a long time. But there aren't many better performers uh, who know how to take over a big, not just a room, but a big theater like he does. Uh, and we're lucky, you know, not to spoil anything, but he does a little bit of that for us too. Uh, he, he, you know, the guy knows how to turn it, <laughs> guy knows how to turn it on. And, and sometimes when he's rolling, we just got to sit back and let him work. Yeah, you, you know, I told I told him this after we recorded last week with him. Uh, uh, here in, in, in Brooklyn, his comedy special is probably the only comedy special that I've ever watched that simultaneously made me LOL multiple times and made me cry multiple times. The depth of this special is just really, really awesome. We have, uh, I would say 80% of the conversation is centered around the NBA. Hassan is a huge NBA fan, grew up a Sacramento Kings fan. We all feel very sorry for him for that. But he was, uh, you know, he's my age, so he was sort of in his prime teenage years um, when those Sacramento Kings with Weber and Bibby and Vlade and Peja were really rocking. Uh, so there's a lot of NBA stuff in there. And then he he blessed us uh, with a, a like six-minute monologue uh, which 
I think was as good of a six minutes as we've had on the show. Can't wait for you guys to hear it. He came. He came ready. He came. He ready. came ready. He came. Prepared. Some people just show up. Some people show up and just answer the questions and keep it moving. And this guy did not. He uh, he was ready for this appearance. To put it mildly. Let's get this episode started with our conversation with Washington Wizard Bradley Beal. All right, let's welcome in Brad. Brad, thank you so much for joining us. This is the second time yes, we've sir. had you on the show, and uh, always appreciate the time. My man, appreciate the time being given. You know. It has been an awfully uh, big summer for you um, in a number of ways. Y'all welcomed your third child uh, in July, and you signed, I think it's the second biggest contract in NBA history, if I'm not mistaken. <laughs> yeah, something like that. Yeah. <laughs> something like that. <laughs> something like that. Uh, before free agency started, you, you, you talked a little bit about sort of what your desire was going into free agency. And there was probably speculation around the league that maybe you would, you know, get traded or you would uh, sign somewhere else. And you said, uh, I know what my decision will be based off of, and that's where I feel like I can win. And, and then in your post-signing, you know, comp press conference or whatever, you talked about that you can win in D.C. Are you lying? <laughs> was it more about the money? <laughs> <laughs> no, I wasn't lying. I wasn't lying. Uh, I honestly feel like that. Um, and it's, it's, it's very tough uh, because you know very well, and just like I do, it's very tough to win, right? Only one one team gets to win, and it's not like I'm sitting here saying, oh, we're going to hold up Larry this year. Like That's not what I'm sitting here saying. But I do believe in what we're building and do believe in what we have. You know, uh, I never had a chance to step on the floor with Porzingis. I think that could be an interesting duo. Um, and then Kuz is constantly developing. Uh, and, and then add the pieces we add, adding Will Barton, adding Monte. So we added some guys who can be difference makers in our team, you know, actually be legit guys who fit into our system and especially the way that Wes wants to coach and play too, you know. So uh, for me, it was just kind of figuring out where I fit best. You know, the market was – a little scarce this year too so that kind of played a little bit factor into it as well um and you know sure enough i feel like dc was it for for me do you feel like a team like boston getting to the finals is inspiration in certain ways and that like that's they had those guys there for a bunt for a bit they made a couple additions and all of a sudden you know they're two games away from from winning it all mm -hmm. um obviously you know that team well in terms of just like the makeup of the team but like when you guys are thinking about adding different pieces you, know, you can see that you don't have to blow everything up to make a jump like that. Yeah, I mean, you see it. You've seen it around the league, right? You've seen Boston do it, like you just said, Phoenix, right? Uh, Milwaukee, before they went on their little run, like they were in the same boat, right? They were building, and now uh, they didn't, like, tarnish their core guys, you know, in order to make their teams, you know, work. And so we're kind of trying to do the same thing. You know, we've – it's crazy to think, like, we have 10 new guys kind of coming into this year from our team last year. And they all serve a legit purpose. And it's going to be unique to see because it's going to be competitive in so many different positions. Um, but it is inspiring, like you said, to see Boston, to see these teams, you know, build and make these runs, you know, these miraculous runs at the end of the year. Um, and then for me to witness it, for sure, going to game three, going to game four, uh, going to game four, yeah, and just seeing my brother out there, like, kill, like, it was, it was, I was jealous and it was, at the same time it was like damn like I want to get a jersey and be out here too so it was it was motivational for sure. I want to I want to ask you about that in a, in a second uh seeing uh your your close friend a guy you, you've known for a long time Jason Tatum have a deep finals run and, and kill during the playoffs. Um but go back to, to sort of the decision to to stay in DC. Was there ever any doubt and you mentioned this free agent year in terms of cap space teams had and options maybe weren't there that they like they've been there other summers was there ever, ever any doubt that you would you would come back i wouldn't say doubt but um i was definitely like being human and thinking about it right i was thinking about what it would be like on the other side on different teams and and seeing what was available for me i i did i did do that right and um like i said like every the market was what it was and it wasn't too promising it wasn't necessarily where i wanted to go what i wanted to do um but and i'll be all like i ended up staying and, and i feel like that was the best decision for me but it was i'd be lying if i sat there and say i wasn't human and didn't think about it have you have you ever come close to 
not necessarily like bailing on DC, but just in terms of this notion of like, you've got to team up with someone else. You've got to, for sure. You've got to sort of use your agent and your power as a player to sort of finagle your way to a different situation with a specific guy. Uh, I mean, <laughs> I'm not, you don't have to name a specific tough. guy. <laughs> I mean, not to that extent, but I definitely, like, I, I think, right. I, I definitely, I live in the present. Right. And so, I have a phone just like everybody else. I see people like, oh, you should go here. You know what it'd be like if you play with Jason. You know what it'd be like if you went to Brooklyn and you went to LA and went to Denver. And it's like, yeah, I mean, shit, it would, it would look good. Like, I'm not going to sit and lie, but, uh, I also know that it would, t- it has to, you know, those deals, those, like, look at Donovan now. Look at all these deals now. Those are, it's going to take a while for those things to get done. It's like, you're going to offer up pretty much your whole team in order to get to where you want to get to. So it's kind of playing devil's advocate too. And in, in where you want to go and, and factoring all that into it. But it's, it's it's a part of the game. Like, it is a part of it. Like, I, I definitely gave it some thought. Like, I'd be lying if I said I didn't. Though. But I guess you mentioned having a phone. Mm-hmm. And Dame goes through this as well. Right. And I would kind of put you guys sort of in the same class of, of guys who have – consistently been great for the team that drafted them and have had deep to deepish playoff runs and performed well in the playoffs and also consistently signed on the dotted line when those extensions are available, right? But there's that noise, that pressure externally coming from <laughs> Twitter. Uh, we were just talking about the the talking heads on television. Um does that ever enter in the equa- into the equation for you? No, no, you can't. You can't allow that to. Um, I mean, you can hear it. I mean, I'm not sitting there saying that you don't. Just like you said, but you see it. But it, it can't. You can't factor it into it. You know, people are going to be fans of the game. I know somebody's going to have an opinion. Somebody's going to be upset at the end of the day. You know, you can't factor it into it. You have to do what's best for you and figure out what your happiness is. You can't do that. Yeah. I have a, my question for both of you, we've talked, to, JJ and I have talked about this a bunch, but we've talked about it with some other guys as well. It's like, is there ever a reason to not take the money when you think about <laughs> how much money it is? <laughs> I, I mean, it just is like, I mean, we, have, we have a ton of oh, listeners and viewers of this thing. And it's like, man. just just look at the numbers. Like you guys can all look up, you can all look up what this is. And I just don't. It's not even specific to you or anything like that. But is there yeah. ever a reason to not yeah. do it? Because I mean, in my opinion, if, as a person not making this money, there is not. <laughs> I just don't think there is. I think that you have you're, you you have a family. Yeah, I, a family. I'm I'm pretty sure if you took a poll, right, and everybody, you know, would you do this? Would you sign five years, two fifty? Yes, think, you have a family. Think, Thank you for saying the number because I was about to say it. I didn't want, I didn't want to make you feel bad, but I was going to also say just, the number. It's just common sense. It's, it just, just yeah, feels like yeah. common sense. I feel you. But, I feel you on that. I feel. <laughs> I feel that like you definitely like like I said, people are gonna have their opinion, so people are gonna think that too. Like like, damn, it's a common sense. Like it's not a, it's not rocket science. Everybody like just sign sign your deal and let that be that. But you know, it's 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 so much more than that. You know, is being here for ten years, uh, understanding what it's like to be a franchise guy. Not everybody has that opportunity. Not everybody's given that. You know. Um, and so I definitely take that on my shoulders very strongly and kind of challenge myself in that way, you know, and kind of why not here? Why not build it here? Why not do it here? Yeah, I think that I think the criticism, truthfully, is is unfounded. And I'm not just saying that because I'm sitting on your couch here at your lovely home. <laughs> I, I, I and I, I actually think I think Dame gets it worse. Maybe 100 percent. I don't I don't you, you guys probably like like a three year age gap. I think that's right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So he maybe he's a little older or whatever. He, he gets a l- worse. And he's talked, he's been on record. He's mentioned the grind and, and loyalty and, and trying to win there um, and being a champion at life. Mm-hmm. But he also says like, of course I fucking want to win, right? We all want to win. We all want to be NBA champion. 100%. Like, we all, like I wanted to be an NBA champion, you know? And there's guys, we talked with Matt Barnes, who's like, I got at the end of my career, and I re- and he ended up winning with the Warriors, of course. But he got he's like at the end of my career, I realized like I had always turned down more money to be on winning teams. Do I regret that? Maybe, right? <laughs> <There's>, <laughs> that enters into the equation. No, it does. 
It does. All these things under the equation. <laughs> yeah, it does. But I, my does. question for you it on does. that regard, though, with in, 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 about Dame is like, do you, are you prepared? Are you prepared? Because there's always, there's always, I feel like there's always been rumors about you getting traded. And there's always <laughs> these fan bases on Twitter yeah. that come up with these trades and these dream scenarios. Mm -hmm. What? Philadelphia. Brooklyn. Right, yeah, like, yeah. right. It, it always happens. Like, Brad's going to end up with us. But are you prepared for the criticism as this contract plays out? Yeah. I mean, that comes, that's, that you, comes you, with the territory. You know what you signed up for. Yeah, it comes with the territory. Like I said, everybody's going to have an opinion. You know, if I should go 0 for 10 a game, somebody's like, oh, wow, wow, wow. Well, look at look what they did. Like, you know, it's, it's going to happen. Like, you know, it's, you can't pay, I can't pay attention to that at all. At all. That's what comes with the territory. With, with this team in particular, you know, JJ played with KP a little bit. Um, but then like Will Barton is just like, you know, it's, it's such a great pickup. He's a, he's a killer himself. Like, what are you excited about on the court with these guys in terms of, you know, getting yourself healthy and getting yourself back out there? I think our size, man, I think our length and our versatility at the wing position, our ability to be able to guard one through four, being able to switch, I think will be able to help us a lot. Um, and then our two big fives, you got Porzingis, who's a footer and you got Daniel Gaffer, who's an athletic five too, you know, and then you got the vet and Taj Gibson. So we have a little mix of everything at the big position. And then I'm just, I'm just super excited about our wings, man, to be able to see Will do his thing, Kuz continue to step into his himself. Um, and then I think Rui's going to surprise a lot of people. He's having a really good summer. I think building off of what he did last year, he had a hell of a year last year too. So I'm excited for him. You got a taste um, in 2016, making a deep playoff run. You guys lost in Game Seven to the Celtics. Still hurts. Yeah, it still hurts. <laughs> and you you made you made the playoffs uh, with Russ. You guys got an eight seed or whatever. But that um, sort of relevance that comes with being on a contender, being on a team that people talk about more. They get more national television games, um, like. Is that the trade-off for you? Not not always getting to experience that in your career. Yeah, I think about that. That does suck sometimes. Yeah, you do for sure, for sure. I mean, we all. I mean, we're all humans. We all, especially as NBA guys, we kind of stroke our own ego at times. We want to be seen. We want to be. We want to have those ESPN games. You know, we want to be on TNT. So, uh, but at the same time, it's it's given to those that win. You know, so I understand that factor of it too. Like shit, I gotta win. Um, Recently, uh, your your guy Tatum went on Taylor Rook's show, and uh, they somehow started talking about superstars and who was a superstar and who wasn't a superstar. Like, I th this is a general question I have for you because we were talking about this earlier today, and I'm trying to figure out what is the criteria to be a, a superstar? superstar. I have an idea. Uh, you're asking the wrong guy. The discussion was between Kyrie and, and Dame, right? So Kyrie has won a championship. I, I guess that's what he has over Dame. But like, if you go down to start talking all all stars, all NBA signature shoe, Dame's there. The Dame's Dame's a superstar. Yeah. And when we start talking about that, like, just take the signature shoe out of the equation. There's probably a lot of guys that are superstars. My thing is like, if you're a franchise guy and you're an all star and you're all NBA player, you're a superstar. Yeah. We t we actually we talked about this with. Jason, when he came on, when we went up there in February or whatever, this was pre all this, obviously, but we're talking about how the voting for the OMBA happens and everything like that and how much narrative and how frustrating it, he was very frustrated by it, but just like how frustrating the narrative that comes into play with this kind of thing where you're like, all I'm doing is playing well, just hooping, putting up numbers and everything like that. And I have all the shit I literally cannot control. That is whether it's in, you know, taking money out of his pocket or just like even just the prestige of being like, I am a all NBA player and I'm not rewarded with that because of shit that I just can't do anything about. That is a crazy rule we got, man. We got to We got to do something. With that. We got to change that. <laughs> There's a lot of guys out here losing money on that. Uh, that is frustrating. I would be frustrated, too. I, I would. You see it every year it happens to somebody every year, every year. What was it? What was that watching him in the in the uh, in the playoffs like for you? seeing his growth as a player this year? Crazy. Uh, one, there's nothing like the finals, right? And so I was literally, like, screaming, like, get out on Steph, like, double Jason. Like, I'm, I'm like, I'm out here, like, I'm actually a part of the game. It's crazy. 
but the energy you feel is is electrifying. Uh, and like I said, it's just motivational, you know, to put in that work, you know, and, and build up your team and try to make that push because it's, it's not easy for sure. And you can see Golden State wanted it bad. That's one thing I I did take away from that night. And you can see the hunger in that team. What do you feel like in his game in particular, even obviously since, you know, you've known him, but even just in the last couple of years and you, you know, working out with him a lot, what do you think he's added that's allowed him to, to just, you know, turn into this generational type player? I think he's just understanding how to use his body more, um, being more physical. And I think he's taking advantage of a six, nine big frame, you know, um, we all know he can shoot jumpers and that's what, I mean, he came into the league shooting 40 plus percent, you know, but I think he's, he's finally understanding, you know, he can get to the basket. He can finish at the rim. You know, those are just easy points for him and the game's just slowing down for him. As you get older, the game will slow down for you. You see how Luca does too. It's just, it's like guys are walking out there. You know, they're understanding the game so much, so much smarter and faster. I get what you're saying. I, I agree. And I think for him, Jason too, like the leap he made this year on the defensive end. Mm-hmm. Um, and a, a, like a, a lot of that is, you know, they have a great group of guys that can defend, which allows him to sort of defend at his strengths. But if you look at a, like advanced stats, he led that team in defensive win shares. For sure. And, uh, we, you know, we saw in the playoffs him guard multiple, you know, high level offensive players and do really well. Which, which games did you go to? I went to game four. I don't know what game. I went to game four. Is that the one where Steph went crazy? Yeah, he went. Yeah, he went bananas. What were you thinking when that was happening? Steph wasn't, he wasn't letting them lose. And you know how tough TD Garden is. It's, they're screaming, they're doing everything they possibly can. And Boston's throwing the, the kitchen sink at him. And he's shooting it from Lucky Irish. Well, I was thinking, we were talking about this, we were talking about this on the way over here. It's like, this is two of the, you know, best shooters of the last 50 plus years basketball in the world. And then you see Steph Curry do this. Like we talked about it at the time. We talked about it with Draymond and we talked about it at the time when it happened of like, just like whoa, like this is this is almost different than anything that you know we've done. It's unheard of. Like he he messed up the game in a good way, you know. Like you think he messed it up in a good way? Yeah. Like like he definitely is. It, I think he all. I think he hurt the youth because the youth just loves threes, and that's all they th- they think about doing is shooting threes. Um, but you can just see, like in the league, just how how we value the three point line now, right? And, it's not just something that we just look at, you know, to as a spacer. You know, we we value it at all five positions. You need everybody to be able to shoot the three because that's a that's a threat. Spaces the floor, be able to create some more drives for your for your guards. So it's, I think you know him and Clay and their whole team. I think just change change the game in a good but bad way. My, I was telling you before we started. My oldest has become obsessed with basketball. And, you know, it's YouTube highlights, started trading basketball cards, um, which got me into tra- collecting basketball cards again, too, oh, which wow. is a very weird thing. But uh, I take him to the, to the gym or I take him to the park, um, you know, two or, three, two or three times a week. And the first thing he wants to do is chuck a three. Like, and he can barely get it there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and he has to use a smaller ball. Yeah. But, like, that's what he wants to do. And I try to explain to him the value of form shooting form shooting get up under the hoop <laughs> get under the hoop and you know 10 minutes of form shooting that's all you need bud but no nah, it's you're right I, I think everybody wants to chuck chuck threes the you, you mentioned the sort of evolution of the strategy around shooting and three pointers and how having five guys that can shoot is so important and the Mavs were a great example of that mm-hmm. and that's one of the reasons they were able to beat the Jazz and beat the Suns and and play with the Warriors like they literally just put five people in the perimeter mm-hmm. and allowed their guards to get in the paint make plays finish the rim Jalen you know mm-hmm. getting downhill Luca getting downhill and I, I think that's like one way that three-point shooting has evolved yeah. but I, I was thinking about like specifically with you and and your sort of development as a as a shooter mm. you know because you know it when i first got in the league like, you shot catch and shoot threes spot up threes and now it's out of the pick and roll it's step Off backs and all that yeah. stuff and i'm i'm curious when you started really feeling comfortable with that part of your game it's still growing it's still growing um but i would say that 20 16 17 year after that, that year against Boston, 
Um, it was crazy because the next year John got injured. John got hurt, and that and Scotty kind of forced me to become a ball handler. And he's like, you know, I need you to play point. I'm gonna force you to do it. And I was turning the ball over, getting double teamed, didn't know how to play through that. And so for the first time, I was kind of into this this mindset. I was like, okay, I got to do more than just catch and shoot this thing and come up pin downs and you know play like that. I got to be able to you know come off a high pick and roll and shoot a three, right, and be able to be that threat that way. And that's when it started. And the tough part about it is that it it takes a hit at your percentage. It's a tougher shot, right? It's not like a coming into transition, you know, rhythm three, getting your feet set. Like it's sometimes it's me off balance, like you said, shooting a step back, shooting side steps. Like it's sometimes off rhythm. Like it, it is, it's a tougher shot, but it's necessary in the evolution of your game. And that's a great, that's a great point. Like that's, that's what, that's what a lot of my threes come from today. Yeah. Cause for someone that guarded you early in your, early in your career and when you play with John and this is when John was healthy and at his best, fast as fuck, open court. It was like, where's Brad? And it was like, fine, Brad, especially in transition. And of course, I had to chase your ass off screens and you chased me off screens too. But like then later on, and I didn't guard you as much late in my career because I was a terrible defender at that point. I could barely move. But later on, seeing that, like having to guard you in so many different actions and developing that way. And to your point about Steph, like, I think that's where he has gotten so much better. And I think in some ways, like James Harden also messed up the game in a good way. Oh, 100%. Do you know what I mean by that? 100%. Because of the ability to shoot threes and ISO. Shoot threes, ISO, and draw fouls. Like, those are the three, right? <laughs> like, like um, that's those are two great examples, right? If you're able to be a threat at the three-point line, like your defender has to respect that. Right. You're always jumping. You're always like, oh, I got to get that. And Steph is a great pass and go cut guy. He's a great, he moves well without the ball. So he doesn't mind giving it up and go. Has a great package, hesitate and dribble. Like he can, you know, he'll hit you with everything. Same with James. And then the ability to be able to manipulate until you draw those fouls. Those are game changers, right? Uh, but those are what separate you. And then I think, the next level is being able to shoot further out, right? You see Dame, you see Steph, even Trey. Trey starting to do it a little bit more, right? If you do that, now, okay, it's like, okay, now it's pick unfair. Pick up points, yeah. 40 feet. Now you pick up point is not even a three-point line. Now we're like volleyball line now. And it's, Have you tried adding that to your game? Yeah. The, the deep three? Yeah. It's it's a it's a love-hate thing. It's a love-hate thing for sure because it's a crazy shot. It is such a crazy <laughs> – it's a ballsy shot. It really do is. Do you – do you jump on it, the deep three? Yeah. So that, but I see it's way more arms. But that's, that that was always my issue with shooting. I mean, I could probably get three or four feet behind the NBA line, but beyond that, I jumped, and then it just became like short, short, short every time. <laughs> sure. And that's where I always tell yeah. I, I always tell people this about those three guys. They all so Trey and Steph sh basically shoot a push shot. They yeah. shoot on they the shoot way up. On the way up. Yeah. And they shoot a push shot. And Dame shoots it off his palm. Yeah. That's how he and he's got, I mean, look, these guys have he has a great strength. base too. Great base. Dame has base. one of the best bases in the in the game. But he shoots he shoots it off his palm. So he gets a little more distance off that. Yeah. So like I, I wouldn't necessarily like if I would teach like that shooting for him. Cause right, we're we're taught you jump, you shoot at the top, shoot at the top, man. You follow through, you get elevation and right. They shoot different. I think that's what makes them so unique and able to shoot that far away. For sure. If it works, like, like Steph doesn't have, like, the prettiest shot, but it works for him. Like, you have a pretty shot. Ray Allen has a pretty shot, like, Clay. straight. Clay. Clay, Clay is, like, robotic. Perfect. He's not even, yeah. yeah, his is sick. But, like, Steph is unorthodox. Like, he'll shoot it any way. And it's like, if it comes off his hand a certain way, he knows it's good. Like, those guys are, like, he's a unicorn. And then, Trey's like the same way, like his little push shot, deep range joints. Like it's like, how is he getting it there? And it's it's cash every time. Have you tried any any of these in the game? Really? Not really. If I do, it's like transition where I got some momentum going downhill. Like I'll pull those joints for sure. But half court, <laughs> off a pick and roll, half like court a, off the dribble, off like one on one. <laughs> 
That's tough. What's weird too with Dame is like Dame's deep threes in half court, he actually just won twos. Like there's not like, you know, you come off a pick and roll and you, I got this from Jamal, but you do it as well. You kind of like throw the ball out there. It's almost like a self pass. It's when the big is in drop, right? You self pass mm -hmm. and then you gather momentum. Gather feet. Yeah. Or you can hop into it, mm -hmm. which also gives you a little bit more yep. momentum and strength. Mm -hmm. Dame just comes off and he's just like a normal one, too. Like he's one, shooting two. from 17 feet. Like stops on a dime. Your momentum is just driving you downhill and just whoop, right into a shot. Did you have a moment or like a period of time when you were a youngster where you realized that you were just a better shooter than everybody else? Yeah, I was always a better shooter than everybody. <laughs> I was always a better shooter than everybody. That's all I was. They just called me like shooter. Eight. Yeah, I did. That's my nick. That was my nickname. I was shooter. I just run in the corner, corner to corner. It's, that's all I did. Did you get the call outs when you checked in the games and like shooter. AAU? Shooter. Number three, shooter, <laughs> shooter, shooters in the game, shooter, shooter, final. I'm actually glad to hear that Brad also got the shooter call out when he checked in the oh, games. Sure. I always, sure. I always thought it was just a white thing. You know, hey man, feel few no, brothers, if you few brothers up, can look, shoot, man. If you, if you're a white guy, if you're, a, I'm just being honest, with you, if you're a white guy, yeah. and you're like the only white on the team and Shoot. you come into an AAU game in Beckley, West Virginia, some random place in April. Shooter, don't follow. <laughs> yeah. It's like shooters <laughs> in the game. They're like, you've never seen me play. <laughs> I could have sauce. You've never seen, <laughs> never seen him play. <laughs> but we know you can shoot the ball. That's one thing we <laughs> know. You can shoot the ball. Speaking of shooting, I, I do want to touch a little bit more on KP because he's another guy that has deep range. Yeah. And I think he's, He's, he has such an advantage when teams play drop coverage. And obviously, we've seen the Clippers series is a great example of this when I was on the team uh, two seasons ago. You know, we've seen teams go small and they switch with him on pick and rolls. But sort of how do you envision that two man game working with KP? It's kind of funny. You remember me and Nene used to run a two man game a little bit? Uh -uh. <laughs> Why'd you similar, bring that up, man? Similar, like, we, like him on the elbow and just. Playing a clear outside, playing two man. Like you got to make a decision whether it's you know stopping me coming off a handoff and either getting downhill or pulling a big out to get an ISO, or you got KP seven three seven four at the elbow, just going to work and you can't block a shot. And so to see that, like I seen that from the bench, right? And I couldn't. I'm over like, dang, I would do this, I would do that, and so I'm I'm definitely curious to get out there and, and, and test it out because he's, I've never played with a big like that. My best big I've played with, with, would be Gortat. And Gortat's a bruiser. Screener. Roller. Screener, roller, hook, hook you to death. Like KP's a, he's unicorn, right? He's, he's special in so many ways. And so sneaky athletic, right? And turnaround jumper can shoot threes. I think he's, it's going to be a force for sure. Just for the listener and the viewer, uh, Brad bringing up Nene is a callback to the first time we had him on the show when we talked about a fourth quarter when you basically invented the throw and go chase action mm -hmm. and I had to guard you. <laughs> and yeah, you scored on me a few times. A few times. But trying trying to get through Nene Nene's screens and two man action when you're cutting, that was a difficult task. That was before they they took out the rule of like Turning a button to the, yeah. the cutter. Yeah. You could cut off people with, yeah, yeah. yeah he was. Bogut he was, was the worst with that, by the way. Yeah. He, oh, yeah, yeah. When you think about like guys that guard you, are there particular guys that do a better job than others? Because we found this interesting stat. We found this interesting stat on, um, oh, let me know. On Twitter. It was not on Twitter, but it was like a, a real stat page that posted this so in 2021 2022 the guards that drew the opposing defense's most impactful defender as their matchup minimum thousand minutes played you were you were third in the league after mm -hmm. luca dame you and then ja so you're constantly getting guarded by the best team's defender are there guys that do it better than others uh yeah for sure is there anybody that pops in your mind are you just uh, are you one of those guys that don't like to give defenders credit? 
<laughs> you know, there's some guys. I don't give like defenders that. credit for making me miss. I don't do that. Like, yeah. I feel like I miss on my own. You didn't make me. You make, give defenders credit for making it tough. On making you. it tough, a hundred percent. Like I'm gonna be do a thousand dribble moves or gotta work. And come a hundred percent. I'll give you that. But if I'm up in the air and I'm shooting, looking at this basket. You ain't got nothing to do with that. Marcus is really good. Marcus is physical, smart. I'll say this: Dylan Brooks is the same way. Dylan fouls a lot, but he's he's physical. Instigators. Yeah, two. Oh man. Oh man. Yeah. I don't remember if we asked you this. Those are the best ones. Like those are I those mean, are the best defenders. A hundred percent. For me, it was the guys like, that talk shit. It was like Tony Allen. Like Tony Allen come in the game and it's like, okay. That's was I crazy. It. I didn't get to play against Tony Allen. Every time we had Memphis on the schedule, either he was hurt or I was hurt. Seriously? Yeah, it was crazy. Is there any does um shit talking have any impact on you? By that I mean like we have we've had guys come on who are basically just like they're like not woken up and then the wrong person says something to them and all of a sudden it's like, oh yeah, like I, I know why I'm here now. And they basically, but then other guys like don't care. They're just like, I'm just here to do a job. I'll talk back for sure. Like I'm not going to be the one to come out and be like, oh, I'm busting your ass. Da, da, da. Like, but if you come out and be like, oh, I'm locking that shit. Like now, okay, now we're talking. Uh, now I'm going to start talking. But it's always, it's always from a competitive mindset and the love of the game. Like I love that though. I, it just brings the best out of everybody. I wanted to kind of get your perspective on on Russ because let's do it. F- for me, I think he was sort of unfairly scapegoated this year with the Lakers. 100%. And, and I said this as soon as they made the trade. We talked about the fit. I talked about it on ESPN. I didn't think it was a necessarily a roster fit that best suited his skill and his talent. And you know his look. His his usage was down, so his numbers were down, and and he also had the ball less in his hands because he played with LeBron. So there's going to be a natural sort of decrease in his statistics. On top of that, it was with the Lakers, and you know there's the added pressure of that and all that stuff. And you played a year with him, and I thought Russ with you guys was unbelievable, and had some crazy stretches, and ended up averaging a triple double, and for mm-hmm. stretches of the season, willed you guys to victory at times. Hundred percent. Him is sort of a player teammate like what's what's what was your experience with him one he's an amazing teammate like he's the complete opposite of like kind of the picture everybody kind of paints him to be at least character wise like he's your teammate he rides for you he doesn't give a damn if you're on another team like paul pierce is like that that's one thing i, I learned from p like p if he's your teammate he loves you to death uh, once you're on the other team, like even if you're his boys, like I don't rock with you, and that's how Russ is. Russ is Russ is the same way. He rides with his guys. He loves his team, and that's what he's all about. Even the staff, like it's it's a respect factor from top down. Uh, and I enjoy playing with him. Like we knew what we were getting in practice and in games, and it was the same guy, right? He'd go hard in practice, pushing everybody. He pushed me. Like he, there is, you know how it is. It's 82 games, man. You don't want to play every game. You don't want to, you know, you're tired. Right, you don't want to practice every day, right? And so to see his mindset, he's like, "No, let's go, B, let's go, keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going." And like he's in the middle of a game, tired as I don't know what, like, and pushing guys and encouraging guys. And so that part of him is is phenomenal. And then just the impact that he has on the game, right? Like he is a guy that needs the ball. He needs the ball. He's going whether it's a rebound. Pushing the ball to the floor, like he needs it, right? And he wants, like, he wants to make a, a mistake versus you making a mistake, right? He'd rather be mad at himself versus getting mad at you, right? And I think that's, that's a simple way of putting it, right? He, he wants to go out and make the play. And it's always a, a pass first play. It's very rarely, unless he, he's feeling it that night, that he's just going to go coast to coast and just say F everybody, right? I think it's it's an understanding like he knew where I wanted the ball, where I liked it. I knew what he wanted to do, and it just made it easy like to just play off of that. And then we just had bigs and our role players and our shooters. Like it just it was just free flowing. It was just easy to just kind of play off of us, for sure. One of the things that has always struck me about him, and you know, to to a degree, like Russ at twenty five is different than Russ now, but how hard he plays like how 
I use the word a lot, competitive stamina. Mm-hmm. Like he has that in spades. Like yeah. he has a lot of that. And that's, you know, look, we, we talked earlier about superstars and what that means, but like Russ is clearly a superstar, by the way, but like all players have flaws. Yeah. And I think to a degree, it seemed like this year, Russ's flaws were nitpicked a little bit more than in years past. It's like, did Russ change? I, did, to me, it was like, Russ didn't get worse. Russ didn't change as a player. No, no. Yeah. It's just like, it's also, just we're going to talk about the fact that he's not a great three-point shooter. He's never been a great three-point shooter. Yeah. Right? It's just, a, it, was a, it was a weird dynamic this year. Yeah, yeah. And it's more magnified because he's in L.A. We were, uh, on the way over here, we were watching the clip of you, the AAU clip. I think last year, mm. like early last year of you. So my two questions are, first of all, did you, were you surprised that like that went everywhere? Cause it was just, it was just you talking. And then the second thing is, mm-hmm. is just like, not with necessarily the AU team, but just like in general with you having to take on more of a leadership position with the team, with even with younger guys around the league who might look up to you. What has that challenge been like in terms of not just being like, I'm going to, you know, get mine and get my buckets, but like, I actually need to, step into a role where people are actually going to listen to me more? Well, one, I didn't know that the clip would go crazy like it did. Uh, I enjoy doing the AU stuff like that, similar to like your TV stuff, Jay. Like I just, I'm trying to figure out if that's something I like to do, right? Coaching, whether it's high school, college, or in the pros, right? And that's, but for me, it's, it's, I didn't have that at that level. I didn't have that NBA player coming back and telling me what to do or telling me just, a little knowledge about the game and just trying to help me just a little bit, right? And my biggest thing is just trying to help them get to college and just understand and see their potential, right? It's, I'm not saying it's going to be easy to get to where I am. Like, I am going to tell you it's possible, though. I'm not going to sit and shit on your dream. You can get to where I am, right? But it's obviously going to take work and it's going to take, you know, that self-discipline, that self-drive. You know, I can't want it for you. Your parents can't want it for you. Our coaches can't want it for you, like, you have to be able to go out every single day and want that for yourself. And that's just kind of the message I have to prove and and preach to them. Um, and the biggest and the crazy thing on the flip side, on the NBA side, it's it's the same thing, right? Now I'm, I'm going to see year 11. That is just a, such a whirlwind to think about. Like it's, it, My career is <laughs> snapping like that, that fast. Uh, but I'm 29 too, so I'm still young, right? I'm still like relative in age, close to a lot of my teammates, right? And so that has been one of my biggest challenges is, you know, encouraging these guys to go be a max guy, go be a franchise guy, go be a star, like be develop into who you need to be and who you who you're capable of being, right? You can be anybody in this league, right? If you just put your mind to it and push yourself. And obviously opportunity plays a factor into it, but like that's a whole new realm that I have to, like you said, I have to tap into. And so it's a challenge, but I'm always a guy up for it. I'm always like I lived it. I've I've done it. I've I've gotten the contracts. I've I've shown I can score. I'm shown I can be an all star. I've been an all NBA guy. Like those boxes are checked. Right now I have to bring up the next next wave of guys with me, right? And and win more than anything. Was that a was that a natural progression? Did was it natural for you, even as a young player, to lead or was it some of somewhat driven by how you developed as a player and the sort of stature and respect you got because you have all those things, the all NBA, all star, all that stuff. Uh, I naturally had it. I naturally had it when I was younger and it was magnified when I went to college and when Coach Donovan kind of like appointed me in that position of being like the vocal guy on the team. Like and when I s when he did that, I was like, okay, yeah, like this is like you can do this. Like you can you can lead a group of older guys, right? You can lead a you can talk to a group, you can organize a group, you can run a team, you can call plays, like you can get guys in spots, like you can do this, right? And and it just kind of naturally carried over into the league. And obviously, you know, there's a pecking order, you know, there's a hierarchy, you got the vets, you come in and listen as a rookie. But I learned from a lot of guys and vets and what to do, what not to do, right? And as well as coaches that have came through. And so um it, it definitely propelled me to where I am now in a lot of my mature ways I, I definitely credit my my mentors and everybody that i came up under for sure because being a leader isn't easy and it's it isn't something i don't think that you can just develop into either 
I just want to acknowledge, uh, you, I didn't realize that you, you were going into year 11 and you were only 29. It's crazy. Man, oh, that it's is crazy. so nuts, man. <laughs> it's crazy. It is like Benjamin Button, but I'm like, <laughs> it's so weird. You, you know, look like, like 24, I'm, man. Like I look you know, like a kid, but <laughs> I'm going on year 11, so I'm like, I'm like a true OG. Like it is, it is so surreal to think about, but. It's also like it's motivation. Just keep going. Like, I can. What's the I, What's I the biggest years. difference you notice with like the guys from the last couple of years versus like when you came in the league? It's a totally different game than when I came in. Right so when I came in, we still had two bigs posting up, so it wasn't a lot of the ISO basketball that you see today. It wasn't spread floor, high pick and rolls, like. Wasn't a lot of threes. It was pin downs, but first we're throwing this ball inside off a of turn five. Like that's that's what the NBA was, and now it's kids are way more athletic. Biggest thing is kids were training more. Like kids started training in high school when training became a thing, right? Uh, and having trainers like these kids were having NBA moves and doing step backs and doing crossover stuff and doing all types of stuff ball handling wise that we couldn't do till we got to the league. Right. And a lot of these kids were doing this in high school and preparing themselves to where they are now. So they're coming in the Lucas, the Jaws. They're already, you know, know what to do and they know what's going on and just attacking the league with, <laughs> like a bull with red in front of them. So um, the game has transitioned so much. And I think confidence wise, these kids are just way more confident. Like they're just, they're coming in believing that they belong and they're going to make a name for themselves. Man. It's it's weird because you brought this up. It's it's sort of weird. I was just listening to you talk, just thinking about like, did I start working out with like a basketball trainer? Uh, and it's like, I mean, I had player development people like my rookie year and that was probably the first time and like didn't really know guys had like off season guy. So probably like third or fourth year is probably the first time I worked with a basketball guy. And then for a long time, it was like, I just had a rebounder. And then Jay Lucas, who's now Duke, um, yeah. worked with me at, at, in Texas when I lived in Austin off season. Um, Ross and Tim Burns when I lived in New York. So like later in my career, I had it. Right. Like when I was in high school, bro, I, I would like beg friends to rebound for me. Most of the time they'd say, no, I'd spin the ball to myself. I'd yeah. shoot it and go get the rebound. Yeah. For me, was, it was his mom. And in, co in college, yeah. co college, you, when I was in college, the coaches couldn't work with you. Like oh, you could yeah, do like yeah, yeah. an That's hour twice a same. week. Yeah. yeah. So it's just it. Again, it's like it's like that Kobe thing with his training, where it's like if I'm doing two hours in the morning, two hours in the afternoon, two hours at night, I do that over three years, four years, five years, whatever. Like I'm gonna be ahead of you. And <laughs> there's just kid, there's this kid uh, in East Hampton where I you know I stay out in the Hamptons in the summer. There's this kid in East Hampton. He's like 13 years old. Toby, and he's doing the Kobe thing this summer, and he's got a trainer who's working with him. And I'm like, it's crazy. It's just different. It's just different. It's why these guys are better. Yeah, yeah. The game is 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 transitioning so much faster. These kids are coming in way more athletic, way more skill. So it was your it was your hungry. mom. It was your mom really more than anybody who was with you, just all the time. Yeah, my mom taught me how to hoop. Taught me how to shoot. She's still on my ass about my forum to this day. Like, she'll hit me after a game. You need to move your guy at hand. You need to, da -da -da -da. like, it's still to this day. Uh, and then Drew Hanlon. Drew, I started working with Drew the end of my junior year, my junior year going to my senior year. Uh, Brad, we appreciate the time, my man. Um, it's always a pleasure. Again, and again, I know I said this to you when we got here, but congrats again. Uh, and, uh, Pretty good summer. Yeah. Kind of can't beat It's that a great summer. That it's, combo. Been, it's been very busy. It's been very busy. Uh, but it's been a blessed summer for sure. For sure. Appreciate That's the time, man. Thank you, fellas.